Good afternoon, everyone. And for those of you in the US, uh, good morning. And I know we have a number of attendees from the Middle East and Asia, so good evening to you. Uh, welcome to today's not-for-profit seminar. Uh, my name is Amit Popat, and I am responsible for Mercer's uh, not-for-profit business in Europe, and I'm Ita. And we have three great sessions uh, today for you. The first will be hosted by myself and my colleague Gilles Laval, based in Canada. And we'll briefly reveal some of the key results from our 2022 global not-for-profit survey that we undertook earlier this year. I'll then hand over to Chris, based in the US. He's a co-leader for our endowments and foundations business and Craig McBride, based in Glasgow, who's a senior investment consultant supporting our endowment and foundation clients. And they'll share some ideas on how we're supporting those clients through some of the current risks and challenges of today's environment, including things like inflation, stagflation, and, and some geopolitical unrest. And we have a very exciting final panel session, which will kindly be hosted by George Dyer, who is the executive director of the Intentional Endowments Network, which supports endowments in aligning investment policies with institutional mission, values, and sustainability goals. George and the panel will not only discuss the case for impact investing, but really will explore how the opportunity set has evolved and how impact investing can be aligned to your mission and achieve financial returns. So let's kick off with some of the highlights from our survey. Uh, the survey we had earlier this year was focused on really four key areas, asset allocation and market trends, sustainability, alternative investments, and business strategy. And thank you very much for those who were able to participate, and we'll be having another, another survey next year. But we had a great response, 130 responses from 20 countries, and clients ranging from below $100 million with over 20 clients with uh, over a billion dollars. So I really feel we have a great representation here in some of the trends that Gilles and I, I will outline. So, Gilles, do you want to kick off with the, the first uh, first outcome from the from the survey? Yes, thank you, Emmett, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, you see the title of that page is Heading Towards Choppy Waters. Um, implicitly, that means that we're starting from a, a better position than what people feel the future look like. And actually, about three quarters of the respondents um, mentioned that they had met or exceeded their financial objectives over the last three and five years. Uh, so I think it's important to, to take at least a, a gander as to where things stand right now. And I think that by and large, not-for-profit organizations are in a good financial position through uh, attractive returns, as well as uh, do donors that have been quite generous, at least from the entities I'm, I'm, I'm in, uh, speaking to. However, um, there are clouds in the horizon, although some would say that actually they're already over our heads. Uh, more than half of the respondents are concerned about the uh, the low um, the low expected returns in the future, as well as the uh, higher inflation. I think that if we had done that survey a few years ago, we might have gotten somewhat different results. Uh, I think low expected returns would have been there because uh, I think we've been crying wolf for many years now, and we might actually get uh, that happening now. But the inflation was not on the horizon. I think that if you, when I talk to clients and prospects right now, the two topics that, that every single meeting I have we talk about is ESG and climate change. Uh, these were the fourth and fifth considerations. As well, I gave results at the high level, right? So I'm talking about the forest, but we're able to slice and dice the information by regions and size as well. So looking at the trees a bit more. Um, and if you look at it uh, more closely, you see that Asia and Australia are actually a bit more concerned about market volatility uh, than other regions. Um, the one thing, though, that it, this is leading to is that some of the respondents are concerned about the capacity of their portfolios to withstand another extreme market. It's about 40% of respondents. Um, so we're starting from a good position. We had a bit of uh, choppy waters in Q1 of 2020, and people are concerned that you know that going forward might be a bit of a bit of an issue. Now, this is a resilient sector because more than half of the respondents are stating they will maintain the spending policy in the next three years. Actually, where I live in Canada, they're going to have to increase it 
because in the latest federal budget, uh, they mandated that a minimum spending policy needs to be increased from 3.5 to 5 percent uh, starting 2023. So that's going to be adding some additional stress and pressure to the system in addition to higher inflation and, and low expected returns. However, I think that the important thing to look at and a nugget that we can get from the from this 39% is if again if we dig a bit deeper and let's just look at the overall results and we look at size so AUM that seems to have an impact on people's confidence uh, about the robustness of their portfolios because if you look at the smaller foundations in terms of AUM you see that the ones that have less than 250 million are more concerned are less confident about the robustness of their overall portfolios Whereas those that have above a billion uh, are a bit more confident and look at about these challenges about expected returns and inflation as a bit less, uh, with a bit more confidence. And so actually, I mean, I think you have a bit of an insight as to what might explain some of those uh, differences in confidence level. Great, thanks, Gilles. And I think your comment on spending pattern is very interesting. And I noticed that uh, particularly those entities uh, below 250 million are also looking to increase their, their spending, interestingly, and not just maintain it, but increase it going forward as well. But if we look really at, um, at you know, private markets and, and, and where is the future allocation, it's interesting because you know, some 65% of the respondents uh, really plan to move away, I guess, from the traditional asset classes, they really don't expect those asset classes to deliver to that future spending desire that they have going forward. And I guess in the truth, that's not a revelation. I mean, we've had an exceptional run since the global financial crisis and the likelihood of the, the returns being delivered in traditional asset classes, I think, is expected to be to be very low. Um, when we look at where the, the changes are in the asset allocation on traditional asset classes, I think there's a couple of couple of interesting trends that were outlined in the in the in the detail i think firstly there is the the move away from domestic equity to global equity uh, that was very interesting so there is still some degree of confidence in equity albeit the reduction is is there is expected to be a reduction but the type of equity exposure is moving away from a domestic bias to more of a global bias and an em mandate really going forward and i think not surprisingly i guess you know government bonds are very much out of favor and corporate credit really has has mixed views with with about 31 percent of asset owners you know should we say between 250 million and, and a billion looking at actually increasing their allocation whilst the largest asset owners are actually looking to to reduce their allocation to to corporate credit but specifically on on private markets allocation you know clearly there's a, a fair number of people and that, that fair number is about 63 percent are already invested in, in private markets. However, if we look at future asset allocation across all asset sizes, so all types of, of asset owners within this particular segment, 75% of them are looking to increase. And really the principal reason and no revelation really to anybody is that private markets will be there to, to enhance their, the return of their portfolio with a lack of confidence in, in traditional asset classes. The private markets asset class of choice uh, for investors is, is private equity. Um, and really, uh, you know, if you look at the, the range between 100 and 250 million, some 34% of them were looking to increase allocations to, to private equity. If we look at the much larger component, again, looking at the weeds, as you would say, Jill, um, if you look above a billion dollars, 68% of them are looking to increase allocations to private markets. So whilst there's a momentum there to, to grow the private markets allocation, and particularly private equity, very much on the larger end, there is a very strong commitment, as I said, some 68% looking to increase allocations to, to private equity. And that really is a global phenomenon. It's not specific to any, any particular region. That being said, private debt and um, private real assets are all expected to increase. Uh, and I think what's interesting is, and we'll talk about it in a couple of slides, um, the, the concern about fees that has been something that's been a trend in the last few years is really dissipating. But we'll come back onto that in a, in, in a slide in a, in, in a moment. Uh, but Gilles, listen, you know, one of the key topics is ESG. What sort of feedback have we got on, on the ESG? Yeah, so um, what we see on ESG is that, um, oops, sorry, the... Um, 
it's in the norm now. So 83% of respondents are doing something or planning to doing something in the near future. Um, now, let's. We, I think we all agree that the range of actions that, be, that can be taken and that would be considered ESG integration is quite large, and we can spend the whole day just talking about that. But I think what we the, the message we want to get across here is that 83% of respondents are doing something. It is the norm. It's not an exception anymore. I think the results would have looked quite different if we had done the survey if only like five years ago. And I think the reason for that is actually the market will respond to demands, right? Some of the pushback we had in the past is that there were no products available. It was not easy to do so. Uh, they might have been in concern about returns and um, that we see that going away. So 61% of respondents saying, look, there's nothing that we don't have to make any compromise to basically invest into ESG. Even more surprisingly, 78% say they don't even have to compromise on returns. Now it's interesting because you still get a bit of pushback on that. Uh, you know, some of the people I interact with, one of the response they have is, look, I have a fiduciary duty to maximize return. That's how it's going to help us meet our mission. And if I do any decision that would have an impact on that return, I haven't met my fiduciary duty. Well, we can see now that that is becoming less and less of a concern for people, even though we did mention people were concerned about low expected return uh, earlier in this presentation. Now, the other thing that I find interesting is that to get to that 83%, you needed trailblazers, you needed pioneers, people that basically believed in it and created the path and market practices, best practices that other uh, organizations could adopt. I mean, the way I would compare it is that somebody saw a mountaintop, there was no path to get to it, and it started climbing. What we're seeing now is if you get to the summit of ESG, you see that, wait a second, there are other summits to climb. There's impact investing, which will there will be a session going uh, a bit later on today, and also net zero target. And when you look at how widely these have been adopted, you see that we're not getting there entirely yet. And actually, it's getting close to what ESG was you know, five, 10 years ago. So with 48% respondent doing something in terms of impact investing and planning to do so in the near future, and it's like 38%. Uh, with regards to net zero target. So again, you have those pioneers. By and large, tends to be in Australia and Europe. They're, they're, uh, they're ahead of other regions in terms of ESG integration and some of the, the other aspects. And that trend will maintain over the next two years if you look at the intentions of the respondents. Now, with regards to, to net zero target, here again, we see that size seems to have an impact because the funds have a billion and more in assets 50% uh, of them have adopted, sorry, a net zero target, whereas it's only about 33% for the ones that have less than 250 million of assets. I think, again, it, it, it makes sense, right? There's an issue about resources. There's so many things we need to worry about. The ESG integration is still a work in progress, impact investing, uh, the move away from private mar from traditional asset classes to private markets, a lot of elements that need to be worked on uh, and then you need to have the resources, and everybody knows that resources are a bit of a, a bit of a constraint at that point. But what we know is that culture starts from the top, right? And so you need to have champions where people believe in it, and basically that will that will drag some of the organizations towards those uh, those objectives. And what we notice is that the number one reason why organizations are not uh, sitting in a zero target is because it's not a board level priority. Um, and so I think that we are moving in the right direction. I think there's going to be an extremely interesting conversation later on on impact investing. And I would uh, surmise that in the next few years, you would see those percentages increasing like we've seen with ESG integration. But with that said, you see that, you know, uh, private markets, impact investing, net zero, um, it's all adding to complexity. And I think there were some elements on that that Amit wanted to touch on. Thanks, Shiel. I'm conscious of, of time here. And, and just for everybody's benefit, um, the full report will be made available in, in mid-June, and um, you'll all be uh, sent an email link to, to be able to access the details of the full report. But just very quickly on governance, conscious of time. Um, it, interestingly, we talk about private markets, we talk about ESG, we talk about sustainability, reporting, etc. And not surprising, the majority of people, 44%, feel that they're their investment program has gotten uh, more complex over the last few years. 
And in fact, only a third of those people, so it's only 12% of those people, really felt that they were prepared for that complexity. And if we ally that to the, the earlier comments about the growing momentum to private markets, you know, how, how are people looking to resolve it? And, and there are two main themes that came out very briefly. Um, there is clearly the need to, to access specialism. And in principle, a large number of people are looking to address, uh, access that specialism through through partnering with some sort of third party third party specialist going forward. I did comment on fees very very briefly, and as I said, what was interesting is that a high number of the those individual surveys who've already got allocations to private markets feel that they've got good value for money, and that the fees have been compensated for well through the investment returns that have been received in those, those private markets, uh, assets that they've invested in. But I'm conscious that we've run into Craig, your time, and Chris, your time as well. So I'll hand over to Craig, Chris, but as I explained, what will happen is that the survey results will be out in, in mid-June, and we will communicate that and send a link to everybody um, on this, on this uh, uh, webinar. So Chris, uh, Craig, over to you.